So I've been wanting to invite you to have one of these conversations, Miranda, for ages. I mean, ages and ages and ages. And with one thing or another, it hasn't happened. And here we are. And I know you know this, but for those that are fly on the wall for our conversation, the whole thing which made me want to do this was to invite people who... I want to have a deep conversation with and to kind of have a private conversation in public and see what happens. Those are always the best. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and the place I, I, that I thought I'd like to start always with everyone is with a kind of a ridiculously big question and just to see how, what immediately comes back from you, Okay. which is, we're here, we're experiencing this being alive. What, what the hell do you think it is? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a Tim Freak conversation question to begin with. Well, I just think it's a grand invitation. It's a grand invitation to open up and discover um, and for each what I call the precious children of humanity and you and I and everyone is a precious child of the the, hum, the human soul, the collective human soul that is nothing less than divine being or God or pure being and that the whole thing is an invitation to wake up and discover and learn and expand and you know co-create you know new possibilities for for being you know and i think that you know in these times where i don't know how it is in the uk but i'm presuming that it's kind of wild and intense and crazy and i'm here based in the united states and well it's certainly kind of wild and intense and extreme here but yet i personally just feel this sense of privilege at being alive at this time and being in the middle of my life and as a woman in this time because i think it's a profound time and none of us know what's going to happen next whether humanity's going to make it um but there seems to me like this enormous invitation to step up it's a lovely know? word invitation it's really it's uh I often use that word myself when mm. I'm when I'm talking with folks. You know, like, and what do you when you hear that word in the context that I'm using it, like and hearing that you use that term too, it's a meaningful word for you. Like, how does it feel for you that term invitation? It's like what the fuck are we doing here? You know? It feels welcoming mm. and it feels I think the reason I use it is it feels respectful. Mm. Cause it, it, it's kind of like come in, you come in on your own terms on, in your own way. Mm. It's, it's not an injunction. It's not a command. It's, it's right. an invitation. And I use it obviously when I'm talking to people, but the idea that life is a bit like that or a lot like yeah. that. Yeah, I think it is. I have a, I, I agree that it's, so it's not so much like an old vision that might have been around in previous centuries that there's a command to be a certain way but more like an invitation to explore how you could be yeah and what's possible and therefore kind of open-ended yeah I, I remember yeah. years ago years and years ago I mean I must be 25 or something really young and having this little switch one day where it went from the feeling that that maybe there was a big somebody something up there with a clipboard kind of looking at me going oh no not so good oh very good very good oh oh, oh, oh you know that kind of thing right yeah to this kind of benign presence going oh i wonder what tim will do next oh yeah oh that's interesting <laughs> that kind of yeah more like that yes i agree it's interesting you say that and we're talking about this because in my first book boundless love i wrote a chapter looking at the 10 commandments as the 10 invitations 
Oh, really? And just meditating, opening up. What if these aren't commandments from a kind of a very old school, you know, beard, man in the sky, should, should not? What if they're not thouts and thou nots? But what if they're invitations? Then what's the, what is the invitation at the core of these 10 principles that are stuck around that are part of deep into Western culture, you know, and I personally found that a very powerful and profound meditation at the time for myself. And I noticed that my students at the time found that really interesting too. And my father-in-law, when he read my book and I met my husband, Bob, that was the chapter he really liked out of the book. And he was an atheist, you know, um, so but it, yeah, your your understanding, if there is something that we might call God or a divine beingness, to my experience of that, there is zero judgment. I mean, just zero. Not it's just it's unfathomable to that depth of totality. But there is invitation, and there is opportunity, endless opportunity and invitation that is completely unconditional. Um, for evolution and humanity rising into our greatest possibility and nobility and beauty. Um, that is always available to us, every one of us, at any moment, no matter how much we've stumbled. <laughs> so somewhere I, th I always feel like you and I connect is what you call boundless love. And you know, that's been the center since I was a kid and yeah, me too. stumbled into it 12 and just went oh my god this is it and everything else I mean I'm, I'm I kind of pass myself off as a philosopher but I'm a love junkie really and it's about trying to account for that really for me it's like how can that be because I know it is but how can it be mm -hmm. and so I'm just really intrigued as to what what your experience is of what you what you mean by it, or I don't know, just tell me, yeah, some, tell sure. me why it's the center for you as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it now it that's the center. And also the absolute absolutely nothing is it's like the cosmic lovemaking to me. You so, know, say the thing about the absolutely nothing. Well, to me, when you said absolutely what's at the center, in mm. terms of where you're coming from, where I'm coming from, you're right. Love is boundless. Love is absolutely the center, but making love to boundless love or out of which the boundless love comes is the absolutely nothing or the absolute dimension, you know, no self, no thing, no one, what might be called the void, you know, what's been called different things in different traditions where there's just absolute silence and, and beingness. So to me, it's like that that and boundless love is this cosmic yob yum of reality with a capital r which is the depth of us all i know that i know that it's the depth of my being and of everyone's being right um so but i encountered reality as boundless love when i was a young person like you sounds like um but i encountered it because i'd lost touch with it and I was suffering from depression and for oh. which I was hospitalized. Oh, really? I and I was that. 13. I was 13 years old. Wow. And so much of like looking back on that time, and I was in an adult psych unit when this realization happened. And I had withdrawn so deep and so far into myself due to a bunch of things, you know, but really the commonality of all the different things that had somehow led to me being in that condition as a young person of not wanting to live anymore, like so withdrawing so much, I, I was unreachable, mm. couldn't begin to share what was going on inside me, didn't trust anyone, felt so alone, felt so disconnected. I, my fantasy was just to sort of just disappear and become like, just disappear and not be here anymore. Right. So I was in a pretty bad way. And I remember lying on that bed in that psych unit. And at that time, this is Perth, Western Australia, um, you know, adult psych unit places weren't, you know, 
weren't very nice or easy places to be in. I mean, surrounding me is people who are going cold turkey off serious narcotic and drug addiction. You know, people with serious schizophrenia and mental health disorders that can be quite scary to be around, particularly when you're a young person. But when you're a young person, and I think, you know, young folks are natural mystics. You know, it's a time when we're all looking at the world and starting to go, what is this? And where do I fit in? And how do I enter? You know? Some, and for sure. Well, for that was certainly my, I was always asking the why questions. Yeah. yeah like as a young too. person, I was always kind of, why is everyone got to be so unkind to each other? Yeah. Why is there so much anger? Why is everyone so unhappy? Right. You know, why is there so much, it just something deep in my heart knew that wasn't mine, that. Mine was, why is everyone pretending they know what's going on? Aha. Uh -huh. But I also think underneath those why questions, I was angry. I was right. angry at the lack of realness, right. at the fakeness, at nothing being very meaningful in the way people were relating and showing up and there being just too much unkindness, you know. Um, and whether that was coming towards me or whether it was just going on in the atmosphere, it was just painful, unbearably painful. So here I was like so withdrawn, so had enough, so like I don't want to be here anymore. And I'm lying on the hospital bed looking out the window and I start to pray. Now, I do not come from a religious family. I come from a pretty secular culture, um, had been exposed to Christianity and everything, but fortunately nothing was shoved down my throat as what I had to believe. But I start to pray to a God I'm not sure I understand or believe in, but I wasn't praying a very enlightened prayer. My prayer was like a mantra, let me die, I'm done, beam me up Scotty, you know, and I meant it. I didn't do anything to take my life, but that was how I felt. And I can only say now that I must have exhausted myself in my resistance to life. And by grace that I don't claim any credit to opening to, something happened. And the best way I can describe it, it was it felt as if like a thousand beneficent beings just exploded from within my heart and filled me from within with the most unspeakably beautiful quality of loving light that was, it was just pure love. And I knew it. And it came with a message or a wisdom that was like the deepest inner instruction possible. And I often find that, that deep spiritual states, they bring a wisdom alive within us from within the state. It's like the state is this guru, right? And it showed me, this is what you are. This is what everyone is. This is reality. And it's always there underneath the seeming battlefield of life. Even when it seems not to be, it's still there like this river of loving light that is unstoppable no beginning and no middle and no end and that the purpose of life is to you know lift the veils so that you 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 know this this river can run and flow and express and be itself so that's what i was shown at the age of 13 and um and i was also told don't tell anyone this until you're an adult and that was a very important piece of the wisdom, because had I said anything to anyone about it, I probably wouldn't have been discharged a week later. Um, but the impact on me at that time was to bring me to this, it just gave me back my sense of optimism, my sense of, okay, I can be here, I can do life. Yeah. And that it's good, even though I knew I was walking straight back into all the same circumstances that had contributed to me being in this bad way. And nothing changed, you know, in my home environment, in my school environment, in my social environment, if anything, things got worse. However, inside, I was plugged into the mains, I knew what was real and true. And that gave me strength. 
and a sense of optimism and open, you know, just a knowing that there was more, so much more, and that my life was going to become about that. Yeah. And so that's really what began my spiritual path. I started to search for any kind of writings and teachings I could possibly find. And like this was Perth, Western Australia in the early 80s. You know, there were only... It's not as bad as Yeovil in Somerset, I can tell you. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the only thing that was available were the Osho people who were a little scary to me because, you know, I'm a young girl, right? And then there were the Theosophists. So I spent a lot of my teenage years kind of in the halls of the Theosophical Society, yeah, pulling yeah, things off, them. books off. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Right, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but so of course then, you know, I spent a long time trying to digest what was this and how do we get back to it and yeah. what needs to happen so that I can live from this. And those were then, it was really the fuel under my butt yeah. that yeah. just propelled me into a whole bunch of study, meditation, inquiry, experimentation, prayer. It wouldn't let me go, and thank God. So I call it boundless love because it wasn't just, when I say the term boundless love, I don't just mean rather a lot of it. (laughs) I mean that it dissolves the boundaries of the ego self, you know, that I'm a separate someone and you're a separate someone and we're not connected. Mm and that dissolves the mental boundaries not only of the construct of separation but the construct of limitation and time and space and all of it so it's non-duality but as you know the most total love possible you know unity in love it's a very it's a very similar as story in in its own way i mean i i've i've just been very lucky i mean there's so many people come to this through suffering but i, I just just walked into it it was just same age a little bit younger sitting on mm. a hill wondering yeah. what the hell was going on and looking at all those big questions and then bang just the the universe is just uh pulsating with love yeah um, it is um, it really is isn't it the, that's the initiative that sets me off. And, but I, I mean, I didn't have, don't tell anyone. So I started writing straight away. <laughs> so, so we did, so I did things with it almost immediately and, yeah. and, and then carried on. It's such a mystery, other. isn't it? Like, you know, I mean, who knows, as I hear you say, you know, there wasn't any big suffering. You were just sitting on a hill in the home environment and asking big questions and everything starts opening itself up to you. And I hear that and I go, that is great and beautiful and fortunate. And, you know, when I look at you now and what you're doing and what you're bringing forth, you know, that's very congruent. Your opening realization is very congruent with what you're up to. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right? And then I look at myself and I can yeah. see the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm passionately devoted to these children of humanity and helping them wake up and grow up and show up and and let every last little bit of distortion and ignorance and suffering be loved out of them and i don't think i would know that except from being in that environment as a 13 year old and being around you know grown people suffering so much and the ones that were supposed to be taking care of them looked to me like they were struggling just as much as the ones that officially had something around their wrists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think these formative experiences and, you know, one explanation is former lives and how they set us up to have certain experiences. You know, it's all grace, really. You know, none of it is without meaning. And I feel very grateful to have so, lived so, through that because so, of what it taught me so i know what you mean when you say that um it's, uh, i i think it's the it's the idea that it's all grace that that kind of it's like, is it all grace um one of one of the things which i which has really marked my well we're talking i mean since that was happening for me it's been 50 something years and it's changed a lot i mean what's changed well the the life 
and and one of the things which has happened f- for me is that the under the understanding has evolved constantly yeah. constantly the love is the love but the understanding has just moved and moved and moved and moved and moved so i find myself with a very different understanding now mm-hmm. and especially as i've got older i mean it's been like i, I thought that things would settle but the opposite's happened it's been like mm. a revolution since i've seen you last it's just turned inside out yeah for me too aha uh-huh. okay interesting i'd love to know more about that because that really interests me and mm. and my i think for me i mean i can go into but it's made me catch things like it's all grace and gone mm, is it and also the whole you know this i mean god's a difficult word for lots of people i, I don't mind it oh i i let you know i know it's a difficult word but I use it anyway. Yeah, me too. Because I think that we all have a lot of stuff about God. And just like, you know, you can't really have a mature relationship with another human being until you've unpacked your family of origin material in some real way. I don't feel we're really free to walk an authentic spiritual path until we've unpacked whatever the word God brings up for us. So I'm like, let's use it. Let's okay, get everything that's, that's, Let's that's explore a, it. That's a strong thing to say. I like that. Well, like you know, that. I give a whole teaching on, you know, okay. All right. on it. And it's, a, it's, I, cause I think it's really important. Okay. So, so, so here, let's dig into You're this. Then, Miranda. What do you, cause for me, that's what the, what I mean by God has changed. What I, yeah. and the whole relationship with the nothing that you talked about, not sure about that mm. either. Uh-huh. So, I, I, my journey was, you know, I almost became a friar. I was, my Christianity was my background, just yeah. about. And then further and further east, a lot of cr- critique of Christianity. Now, lots of critique of the east, same mm-hmm. thing, just feels like, mm, not sure about all of that anymore. And finding mm-hmm. something brand new. Uh-huh. So my understanding of the nothing, of non-duality, of God has changed dramatically. So uh-huh. it'd be fun to dig into what what changes yeah. you've had and maybe I can try some ideas on you and see what you make of them. Well, go for it. So there's a bunch of questions in what you've just been sharing there. So which one should we dig into first? Yeah, any way you like, any way you like. Do well, I think, I think let's go for God, right? Yeah. Let's because go for it's God. so provocative, right? It's so provocative. And I just, I mean, I'll start with this way in that my heart, in my heart, the word God almost brings me to tears. And while I was raised in a vaguely Christian culture, as I said, I didn't have anyone shove anything down my throat. So I have, I had a kind of a freedom that not everyone has that now I see was tremendous grace to go, well, you know, what is this thing we call God? Like, all I know is so, that... So, Miranda, let me just... So, do are you saying... When you said you see that as tremendous grace, yeah. and I'm not saying it's not. Yeah. Do, in your eye, it, 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 do you have a God who's running the show? Um, I would not say there's a there's some kind of supreme being that I could say this or that to. I would experience God as this as a supreme pulsating reality, not as a person. It I can. Don't, I don't mean like a, okay, but is it when you say it's grace? Yes. Well, I mean, that's a big thing because my whole body of teaching is about grace. So, okay. so to use the word grace, you need to let me quantify what I mean by grace because people think of grace in a very simplistic way. Okay. Right. So to me, grace is divine presence coming alive in our direct experience. And it can come alive in many different kinds of ways. Sometimes it's really fierce, you know, so we might, it might not feel like it's grace when you're in a psychiatric unit or you're going through great hardship. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Right. It might not, it certainly doesn't feel like grace when you're sick, when you've broken your leg, when someone you love more than life itself is dying. Is that grace? Is it all grace? Is it like I you person- just didn't notice the fact that when the two-year-old kid was being raped, it was grace? Well, is that, I would is it not. All grace. I don't know whether I would concretely say that, because I think it's easy to then use that, misuse that, to dismiss human suffering and to respond to human suffering it, with platitude rather than depth. And I'm not into that. I don't, I don't mean it like that, obviously, but I mean, 
what do you do with that? Do with what? To your girl who's raped and murdered. You be there. You, no, no, you no, no, sorry. Her. I don't mean what you do with it, with the suffering. I mean, what do you do yeah. with it, with your conception of Yeah, okay, God. right, 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 right. Well, I have to, you know, relating to extreme, awful, painful, horrific things that human beings do to one another. When yeah, or or, or that nature does to us. It doesn't have to or be. Or that nature does to us, right? We have accidents or earthquakes happen and people's lives get destroyed. You know, obviously from the point of view of that personal individual, it's a tragedy and it's painful and it's horrific and the only appropriate response is compassion. Mm -hmm. um, however, I know from my own moments of really tough things, and I've had a pretty extreme life, so I've had some pretty tough things I've had to deal with. When I review, like, what was that and why did that happen and what was the meaning of having to go through that body of experience that was incredibly hard at the time and through which I almost didn't make it, from the perspective of more time and space, I can see it absolutely was grace from digesting my own deepest challenges. So, so when I look back, like, I would go as far as to say I would – put myself through my most difficult moments 10 times over for the understanding and the love and the wisdom that got forged in the fire of those moments. I completely understand that. I completely understand that one can go through the most awful things. Uh, I can think of those examples myself. And they, if you come out the other end, you, mm. I think it's very common for people to come yeah. out with something. Of yeah. great value, right? I, th the, I think the thing I'm trying to work out in the way that you're seeing everything mm. is how that relates to God, or how that relates. What it's one thing to go, it was actually shit, but I mm. came out with this. Yeah. To it was kind of given to me as a grace, as a thing which was for me. Yeah. And then, and then it's like, mm. whoa, really? It's like, what, what's, what, and, and is there a way around that? And how does that sit with the feeling of that it's right. a band of love? Because I have that the same. Mm -hmm. Well, I think though, I wouldn't claim to say everything's grace just as a platitude universally, but I would say from my own body of experience, um, while it doesn't seem like grace when I broke my leg last year, you know, that made laughs really tough. Well, it doesn't seem like grace you know, that friends of mine got COVID and died, you know, while it doesn't seem like grace to watch people I love suffering greatly with cancer. Nevertheless, I can't deny that in these extreme and very difficult, very human challenging fires, certain things get forged that I don't know whether they would have been forged otherwise. And I so to me, they, they the, probably wouldn't, they probably wouldn't, but that right. there's a, there's a, it's interesting having this conversation with you because I'm, I'm reminded of Ramdas who says very similar things. And I had the same issue with, with him mm. um, as I've got older, I didn't mm. at the time, um, of um, what, oh, I'm going out of focus. Excuse me. Let me turn myself off and on so I come back into focus. There we are. There you are. <laughs> um, there's one thing which is you can benefit from anything. Yeah. So I completely get that. And there's, but what is what and i'm and i'm not i'm i just want to make sure i understand you mm. when you say it is grace mm -hmm. let's think of it you talked about breaking your leg but let's imagine uh, that something happens with someone else someone else hits you with a car let's yeah. say, and you break your leg. if that's grace what is the agency of the person driving the car I mean, this is the age old question. How much agency do we really have? Well, how much agency do you think we have? Well, I think it varies. I mean, yes, I think but you some, have some. I, we, I think we have some, we certainly okay. have agency. How are we going to respond to this? How are we going to work with this? Coming back to where we began in this conversation, which is about invitation. But, but how can you have agency in what you, in what you're responding to? And yet the person who hits into you is an act of grace. Well, if that's not their agency. It might be. I mean, it's a deeper, it, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into the question, 
how much agency do any of us really have? Okay. So I have come to the conclusion that I'll just speak for myself. I have a lot less agency than I used to think I did. Okay. Right. And um, I mean, I'm a devotee of Ramana Maharshi, and he was really strong about this. Yeah. That about not having any much. agency. Didn't right. You? Exactly. I mean, he said to his mother, you know, he was 16, yeah. and his mother, like any mother, was beside herself, like looking all over India for her wayward runaway son did what any mother of a 16 year old would do which is begged him to come home sure and he said to her you know the ordainer of souls controls the fate in order with their destiny that which is destined to happen will happen try as you may to prevent it that which is not destined to happen will not happen try as you may to make it so i mean so that I is a very that idea miranda i hate that why why horrible. do you hate it why well, do you because, hate it because it takes away everything that makes us human you reckon i don't I mean, I think so I'm not I, saying, well, well, I'm not, but, I'm not but saying I, but the mere fact you're saying I don't, that's just destiny. And the mere fact that I'm saying, Oh, I don't know. I think our, we do have some volition. We're not puppets. I and think yet, we have. So, so just hear me right. Okay. So I'm not saying I agree 100% with Ramana's summation. Okay. All right. right. All right. I'm saying I, if I were to put a percentage on it, right. I'd say about 80%. I agree with that. Um, but I'm still in process, in progress. It's still an ongoing question. So do you, you know? think you're gaining? So my sense would be that I, I have volition, but the bit that I'm conscious of is small because I need to work at it. Um, uh -huh. But that, I, that, that we're all actually evolving into that and that it's increased for humanity generally. Um, yeah. And that's why I think the idea which I associate with Romana and, 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 and Nizagadatta and people I was being very influenced with in the past feels like, oh, I don't, that's a very, that's a negative idea, actually. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's, it's, well, it, it's part of the denial of the self, which also seems. Yeah, a very see, I don't, thing. I don't put Nizagadatta and Ramana in quite the same camp, personally. No, the, you, you know far more about Romana than me. I know Nizagadatta quite well. I know yeah. Romana. A bit, so yeah. I, I don't want to say. So the thing wrong. about Ramana that illuminates a lot of this is when you read stories about how he was with his close disciples, and you see the immensity of the love and his sense of humor in it all. Right, and so what we have to remember when we're looking at these Eastern masters, I, I mean, again, you and I. One of the things I also think you and I have in common is we love big picture. And I've never been satisfied just to take one cosmological view and settle on it without exploring, well, what about this? And what about this? And, what about, and what's the big picture? And what do they have in common? And where are they different? And how does that relate to now, right? Yeah. And I see all of the great worlds, religious and these different streams as having immense wisdom and gifts to offer us, but that it's all a continuing unfolding body of mystery yeah. and realization and that that's continuing here yeah. and now yeah. in our dialogue at this yeah. time exactly right? yeah so yeah. i see it as a continuum not yeah. as this yeah. is me right too. or me that's too. wrong yeah. and for me that helps me to stay open and awake to new learning and possibility that might not have been available in the 1950s who knows yeah exactly i i feel right? i feel really the same i think that's yeah. very clearly yeah beautiful. so that's kind of what's interesting and why I'm here with you, because I know that that's where you're coming from too. And it, that excites me because I do think there is something that's trying to happen. That's new. Okay. Let, let me try a new idea on you then. Or it, okay. might, not be, you're not, it might not be new to you, but it was, uh -huh. it was new to me when it really hit me. Uh -huh. So God, uh, we have the same experience, I think yeah. very similar yeah. of yeah. what God is. How the hell does that fit with ah, the world? So one of the things which happened for me as I got older and why I was attracted towards the non-dual stuff, the emptiness more as I got older and God kind of faded was all of the classic problems with God, which is, you know, if there, if there's something which is running the world, look, it's the, I, I can't You're clearly missing an action. Yeah. Yeah, really. And, and it's like, <laughs> you know, if, there, if there's a God 
and that God is responsible in any way, either as a presence or anything, for the unfolding of 14 billion years of evolution and seven complete extinctions and 250 million years of dinosaurs. It doesn't look like a God that knows what it's doing to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the, you know, it's like one can look at the suffering and go, yeah, but look what we gained. And, and I get that. And it's really true. And it's beautiful, actually. It's really deep. Mm. But that little thing, I forget what it's called now, that was in the news recently, a little bug that got in a kid's ear and ate its brain from the inside. Mm, we gosh. don't need that. We don't need that. Mm. That, you know, that is, that, we don't need that. So how can, and that's what, that's what has led to the, obviously the rise of atheism and, because this God is kind of mean and stupid. Well, it seems. It seems. Where we sit. It does it's seem. From where we sit. Right. Yeah, that, but that, if from, we look from at there, it. So yeah. here, but here's the, here's the possibility. Yep. Which um, I, I've been for a time, probably when we last saw each other, I think I was, I was doing this for sure. It's just built momentum. Was this idea, is it possible to account for everything within one evolutionary picture of emergence in which one thing has led to another thing has led to another thing has led to another thing, which has got us from 14 billion years ago, pretty much just hydrogen to you and me having this conversation and starting with the very simplest of things and then ending up with life and psyche soul. And, and what struck me with that was, well, if that's right, if that were to be right, then this thing, this presence that I'm experiencing as God would not be at the beginning. It would be what this is flowering into. Mm -hmm. That the whole universe is flowering into this. Just like... Well what, well, what if it's always been God all along? Yeah, but if you've got that all along, then you've got all those problems. But if it's not, you don't have any of those problems. What you have is the same process with you and I, whereby we have come into, you know, it's like, you know, I was a fertilized egg once and you wouldn't have had a conversation with that, mm -hmm. but it's flowered into Tim, this mm -hmm. guy doing his best. And that the idea that maybe in the same way we, we could understand that bandless love, not as there all along, not as there at the beginning, but the most emergent level Mm -hmm. of this process that we're in well which is yeah. why it leads us towards it mm -hmm. and it is not and and it and it's not running the show mm -hmm. it's arising from it mm -hmm. yeah that's a beautiful way to look at it i mean from my own kind of inner experience i mean what what feels true to me is that it is what we are is pure potential. Our nature is boundless love. Our nature so is inherent. Take those two a second, Miranda, because yeah. it's just perfect for me to try and put this across. Yeah. We're pure potential and boundless love and separate those two ideas by 14 billion years. We well, what if potential. I can't separate yeah, that? Well, no, but, but what I'm saying, well, they're obviously they're not separated because everything's one continuum. But what I'm saying is, what if you put one at the beginning, which is pure potential, yeah. and one as to what we're growing into, mm -hmm. which is boundless love, so that instead of them being like just what we are, so mm -hmm. instead of the mythos, when you said about... we, But let me finish. Okay. But I think, I think it's both because I think it's pure potential is what we fundamentally are and what we potentially are. And there's no end to the possibility of the unfolding and the manifestation of that pure potential, including even beyond boundless love. I agree. Right. So that's what's exciting is that there is no, in my Who experience, certainly what I've seen, like in my own inner experience and in just working with people, because I'm very much kind of in the trenches and have been for 30 years. I'm. I don't spend a lot of time writing books and that's largely because, you know, I actually love working with people and that's where my biggest turn on is, is like seeing what's going to support this 
magnificent mystery in front of me opening up to its mm. fullest possibility and being mm. as beautiful as we can possibly be you know mm. to me that's about the most meaningful way to use my time and so you know what i see is there's no end to the possibilities of our being and our becoming and that the beingness and the becoming are not two ultimately I agree completely yes right. yes and that that's the invitation in every moment continually to do that yeah to be so, what so, we are so to what know if, what we are and to manifest and become more fully what we are as so, long as we're here so what if the twist you know you said look things it's one continuum yeah. which i feel too and maybe they didn't know things that they knew in india in the 1950s right well the big thing which they could have known in india but probably didn't in the 1950s is that we live in a, we live in a process in evolving universe so the mythos that you get really since the actual age maybe 2500 years ago and, and then it moves and changes but you can see it repeated over and over again mm -hmm. is we've lost it it's all it's what we really are we lost it mm -hmm. we fell into yeah. an illusion we felt the self is in the way your humanity is in the way your passions are in the way your attachments are in the way your desires are in the way you yeah need to get rid of all of that loot indeed your whole self and return to what you already are which is this perfecting thing yeah well i do i look at it a bit differently well, okay. that, that no, I'm, not, I'm not saying you think that yeah I, yeah I'm saying because i don't the, no, yeah. no, I'm not saying you think that because, but I'm, that is the, but that's the prevailing point of view. That, that's been the point of view for a long time. Yep. So if this is a continuum and we're moving, maybe the change, and I suspect that everything you think I suspect is being informed by this, I imagine as well in, a, in your own unique way, which is that if we now are understanding, oh no, a much more positive view, which is not that we've fallen from what we already are and we need to refine it, but that we're actually evolving into what we could be which is mm -hmm. what I hear you saying there. Mm -hmm. And, and that the whole thing then becomes, well, first of all, it means that the individual isn't in the way. It's the foundation from mm -hmm. which we, I agree. Up I agree. Us. And it's a bit like when you look at the psychological understanding of having a healthy ego, right? And that the first phase of human life, you know, like childhood and is ego development. Mm -hmm. We have to develop. And if, you don't as a parent help your child develop a healthy ego they are going to suffer and have a really hard time in life exactly right? so, and so i think all this talk about ego you know the ego gets bashed and though i think part of the gift that western psychology has brought forth into the mix is no it's actually very important yeah. to be, to become a healthy person yeah right and that spiritual work alone ain't going to fix certain things that happen when That's you don't change, develop it? a, it's a huge game big change, change. Really and that happened change. you know in the, after the 50s predominantly yep. you know yep. so this wasn't part of the body of teachings of ramana and nisargadatta at all besides which eastern culture and, is and it fundamentally contradicts a lot of those teachings doesn't it yes yes but also eastern culture we can't separate lineage and tradition from the culture out of which it came so when you Definitely. spend time as i have maybe you have too in the east mm. you get it well western culture is enormously individualistic yeah. right and eastern culture is not the the not, not yet but it's getting there it's changing but traditionally and we have to remember that all these traditions buddhism hinduism advaita they all come out of these cultures that are very collectivist the need of the individual is not so important what's happening in the collective is what's important what matters and so while you get things like arranged marriage it's not about whether the couple are happy it's whether it's good for the family and the society but, that, but, that, but that's where we were not, not that long ago Yes, exactly. But you know, so you see it from with the in, informed by these yeah, yeah, things. It's just, also, it's older. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, that that we have to take that into account as we're assessing, how do we walk a real spiritual path, and live into our highest potential now, not dissing anything, but just seeing it as purely and deeply as we can and being open to new learning and insight. And not at not getting overly attached to a cosmological worldview 
out of our love and devotion to a guru if what we're what's being revealed by life is or there are certain pieces that you know aren't part of that cosmological view that we might benefit from opening to so so i want to talk i get a lot of shit for this by the way you know yeah yeah, because well, you know, that, that scene is not is pure is, Advaita or not pure yeah, Course in Miracles. It, it, it's and really every, not. Every tradition that I have taught and wa- walked through, I always get that, oh, this isn't pure this or pure that. I, I have the same thing. I've, I had a major trans. Well, I don't want to go into this with you, but I did, I did have a big change in my understanding where I I, I turned the whole it all exists in consciousness thing was very central to me and I don't think it's right at all now and that was such a big change and I endlessly get people telling me that I don't understand and that I've you know missed the point even though they could read my books and it's full of them but I had to come out and go look my 30 of my books are not right they're just not yeah. and and so let me, I want yeah. to try I want to but just... coming back to what we were talking about about okay so then is this ego in the way yeah 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 and I, I view it more like, this is why I term the practice of what I teach ego relaxation, right? Mm-hmm. Is that, yes, if we look at the analogy of ice and water, right? You see that a frozen cube of ice is opaque, it's hard, it's fixed, it's dense, like, mm. like ego consciousness. When we're caught in our ego, we're caught in history and hurt and heartbreak. We're not seeing the big picture and we might have reactions and pain about that mm. and that that might most might obscure our possibility to show up with the, the greatest openness and and willingness yeah. in this moment to respond to what is here now right and but yet the fundamental substance of ice i.e our ego is still water even when it's frozen so my point of view is even the parts of you that are caught up in ignorance and patterns it's still holy is still divine being or God, even when it's caught up in stuff, it still is what it always is and has been. And so the question more is, well, what is going to help the density within us, the suffering within us, the closure in us to melt and open up so that we can become more transparent and available and flow with what's going on and what is trying to happen now, right? And to me, I come back to love because what I know from my own experience and working in the trenches with so many people in their toughest material is what helps us most is when any part of our experience is greeted with unconditional loving acceptance. Hmm. I know I can cut through my own bullshit. I know I can tell the truth. I know I can own up to stuff I'm not proud of. I know I can find courage and strength to deal with hard things when that love is present Mm -hmm. much more effectively than I can with should and judgment Mm. and pressure to get over my ego. So, so one of the ways that that that's that I've started approaching that identity thing mm. is, is is just really simplistic maybe i don't know is to go look you know every, every, it seems like look everything is the one in relationship to itself yes that's what everything I, is right so so there there is a fund of, if i look around me and i th- think if this even is, is, is if it's an evolutionary process what is the simplest quality that everything has and that's the quality of being and then it's mm. being in all these different ways and it's evolved into all these different ways of being including being tim and being miranda and so that what tim fundamentally is is not just this he is this but he's not just this because he's this in relationship to the universe which is why there's never a moment when there's just tim there's always tim in relationship with the universe yes and the shift that happens and i i think of it i've coined a phrase just to help me think about it from an individual to what i call a univigil an individual conscious of unity with the universe whereby you 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 recognize that the, the 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 oneness of being is arising as everything including you Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When that oneness really kicks in, th- th- it feels like, like 
love is how that oneness feels that when i recognize that communion with everything and everyone especially other people but everything and there's this and there's this like you said the 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 the, the barriers are transparent because I am just Tim. I'm just Tim, but I'm also the universe as just Tim in relationship to everything else. Yeah. And the response is this love. Right. And my hunch, and this is like, you know, I don't know what this is really, but I, like you said, it's a, you, I forget what you said, an intuition or a feeling, of, but it's really pulling me towards it like mad, is I think it's when we come into those states that God is arising. That I mean, literally, that's what's that's creating. That's why I call it grace. That that's creating God. Yeah. Well, so that, that it's it's creating grace, which is well, a direct let, let, palpable. Let me, let, me, let me let me push a little bit harder. Okay. Because what I'm trying, what I'm suggesting is, a bit, like through the through the evolutionary process, somehow a bunch of individual cells got it together over a long period to create mm -hmm. something as complex as my body. Yes. Which is a communion of cells. Right. Function as one thing. My sense is that when psyches, when souls come into profound communion, what's arising is a communion of souls. Mm -hmm. So there's a universal soul which is actually forming from souls in communion. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is I, my, my, my whatever is that 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 enormous love that huge universal benevolence mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. it's this next level on from yeah. you know and i call that grace i call okay. that grace okay right? All right. and so grace the signature of grace is love mm -hmm. but that's not its only possibility mm -hmm. right there can be the signature of that as a thunderous silence, as a pure presence, as a pure awareness, because there's limitless possibilities and potentialities. I, and, I, 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 I get that. I can, yeah. I, I, think, and, I, I don't think it's kind of just floating inactive. I think it engages no, it's not. It's dynamic. all the time. Yeah. It's yeah. dynamic in yeah. the same yeah. way that yeah. I'm often saying to my students, you know, next time you go to a funeral where there's an open casket, just actually like, take it in because yeah. it's powerful when we see someone we loved and their body and that they're not there anymore but there's yeah. a body yeah. lying there yeah and to yeah. really let yourself not be afraid to contemplate that because it helps you realize it's this sort of pulsating animism dynamism mystery that is causing all the thoughts to come together and the, the the joy of learning and discovery in both of us that's causing our heart to really want to know what is reality, what is humanity, how do we be as real and true and open as we possibly can be right now, and how do, I mean, I don't know about you, but every time I'm getting off my meditation, I pray for just any grace that can possibly be given for what comes out of me to be a blessing to others today, right? And like, but what produces that motivation in a system over here and not in Donald Trump, right? It's a curious, I can't, and the only thing I can say to that is, well, this is what Grace wants to do over here in this location, you know, known as Miranda. And it's possible for that to happen everywhere. Oh, but it's Miranda. Well, yeah, I I experience that love. You know, but what I mean, I mean, it's like it's like you no, know, but that's Miranda. Yeah, the, the, the field of being has arisen as Miranda, and Miranda okay. has touched these very emergent states, and that's now who she is. That's Miranda. and it's what and it's what she's on fire to share. Yeah, that's right? who she is. That's who I am. That makes you what you are. Right, and that there are unique gifts and qualities in all of us that are equally valuable but they're not all the same one of the things i really like i'm not sure if this is how this all works for you but i'm going to throw it out anyway just in case one of the things i love about that very simple analogy of going look this there's a process here which is can, which we've already seen like cells form multicellular organisms we've seen the same with chemicals could it be that psyches or souls are forming a greater entity, which is what we're experiencing? Are. 
And what I love about that is, you know, what, what's, why, what's the difference between me and a slime mold? The cells. Is that in a slime mold, which functions as one thing, all the cells are the same. So mm. it's just a slime mold. What makes me me is all the cells are different. Mm -hmm. They're all doing something else. And because they're all different cells doing different functions, you get a Tim. And it mm -hmm. feels like that with God. Because mm -hmm. all the souls bring something different, this thing which is more emergent, which the, which the universe is flowering into, it, it is... Oh, we've frozen. Able to, oh, uh, you're fine. Am I back? Uh, you're back. So maybe right. let's kind of back up from, give it a minute before what you were saying. Oh, you're frozen again. Oh, it there going? you are. Better. Okay. There we are. It's real life. The, the, so what I'm saying is that because the, 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 the cells are different, you get a Tim. And because the souls are different, this, it's more than a collection of souls. It's a communion of souls forming something greater. And that therefore the process of emergence, which has led to more and more and more, which has led to soul mm. as the, what looks like the cutting edge isn't, there's something more, which is why when you experience it, it feels more real, more amazing, the most, because you're touching the leading edge of this 14 billion year process of becoming in which being is becoming more and more and more. Mm. And yeah. that's what God is. God is the flowering of the universe. I agree. I agree. And God is the substance of all the all the seemingly individual beings that are flowering, but they're not. Uh, they're individual, uh, but they're not separate. I love how um, Zogchen describes everything and everyone as multiple displays in the one fabric of being. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah, I love, love that. that. I, and I, I often kind of I get. I love that. I love that. Because the substance of what you are and I am and everyone is, is the same equivalent divine holy substance. You know, we're made of divine being. So, and so I don't all... know what the words holy divine mean in that instance. That's, uh -huh. what, that's the change. It's like, it feels like... Well, the fabric itself is holy. And what does that mean? Well, why, is the, why is the fabric W H O L oh, oh, it's a whole, yeah, okay. Holy. Okay, but why... Right? Do, it's whole. Why... But but yeah, it's definitely a, it's definitely one, but 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 I I don't I don't when I look at it feels like the the to know, I don't know what the, I don't know what the words mean anymore. Well, here's I'll just, just kind of when we to, apply them to I'll things. Cut to, like I'll that. cut to how it impacts me, okay. why I say that, and why it feels important and valuable for me to hold it that way. Yep. May or may not be accurate, but it feels accurate okay. from my experience. The impact of that cosmological view helps me bow to everyone, even people I don't appreciate or enjoy. Okay. It helps me not to annihilate or disregard anyone, including people whose way of being in the world I find painful. Okay, so for me that comes from the I, – I, there was a – there was a – a moment a little while back when I thought, mm, I talk a lot about big love, and, and all, but, but love is an emotion and it does come and go. And mm -hmm. if I was completely loved up all the time, I couldn't function. But something stays the same. Something builds, actually. Something has built, it, built steadily through my life. And it feels more like a, like a, a universal benevolence. Like mm -hmm. even when I'm really pissed off with somebody, I mm -hmm. wish them well, actually. Yeah. Even when somebody's on the TV, a politician, I'm going, oh, actually, I wish them well. Even yeah. people doing terrible things. Right, me too. And, and that, it feels, comes from, like the optimism you talked about right at the beginning of the conversation, it comes from touching that. Well, I think it comes me. from a deep immersion in the reality of boundless love that helps you see that the fundament, you know, it helps you see with a deep generosity um, and it helps you see everyone as valuable and precious, even though their behavior might be causing a lot of trouble. I had this right, thing. Everyone's, everyone's existence is fundamentally precious. Everyone yeah, matters. Yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so that's for me part of 
the insight that the realization of boundless love gives is the sense of that everyone's precious and yeah, therefore yeah. everyone deserves to be treated treated with respect and dignity and a fair shot and that isn't always easy to live no <laughs> right and so i think i want to say that too because in these times where we're dealing with you know let's just say some human beings in deep suffering and have gone down some dark places that what they're propagating i mean here in america i mean it's kind of scary and painful the extremism that is pervading our culture and that is taking away women's rights that is having you know in it's going to have really awful impacts on so many human beings and on society as a whole that is hard and so i want to name that in this conversation so that we're not just sort of talking theoretical that these deep cosmologies and our our struggle our grapple to try to find then how do we be a more real noble human being you know because to me that's the whole point of any philosophy or spiritual path is to help us to be more real and true and noble and beautiful as best we can in the muck and the mess of all of this <laughs> so part of what's happened for me and this is probably another conversation maybe we'll have another one but um in that has been the recognition of how important it is to understand other people in their own within their own ideational network yeah not from mine yeah. I do understand it from mine. And I became aware that this is really recent for me. And I, in my 60s, I can't believe it took me so long, just like not seeing these things. But it's getting old is shocking. It's a reevaluation of everything and, and humbling, really, or humiliating. I don't know which, maybe a bit of both. The, the it, is I just thought, you know, I've spent so much time viewing people with different perspectives not, not spiritually now but politically let's say mm -hmm. um and really thinking that the that there was only the only kind people all kind people must think like me and not realizing that people could be very kind and think that i'm dangerous and wrong yeah. and 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 have a different and the reason i reason i i, I just picked up on that because one of the issues which really jumps out at me was when you said um taking away women's rights yeah and the place i went to i don't know if you were referencing this was um, the abortion debate absolutely and what's what i'm aware of with that is is what a great example that debate is of how people how we tend to see each other through our own ideational network and not through the others because i see one side in that going you're baby killers but the other they're not baby killers they don't think they're babies and the other side going you hate women they don't hate women they're just trying to protect what they think are babies and and of course there's bad people on both sides but the, it's that in it's where we feel i feel like we the part of the benevolence is to see, really really listen to people in their own terms now and to and and that that's the thing we're missing why everyone seems so extreme because mm -hmm. we're thinking what i would say monologically rather than paralogically rather than being able to process things in parallel do you know, do you know what i mean by that i hear you but i don't necessarily agree with where you're going on this okay. because i think what you're not including and integrating in what you're saying is the this interesting phenomena that seems to be here is a lack of reasonableness and both sides feel that don't they yeah not because i see i see so both sides going you're, like you're if i mean like, if if, if we would go with your the the um the, your argument here yeah. so pro-life for example mm -hmm. well i'd have a bit more respect if those people were as interested in supporting the women that now can't have an abortion and being mm -hmm. more interested in social supports so that you know women can have that child and raise it in decent conditions and there's none of that they're interested it's pro-birth 
it's not pro-life i'm not sure you're right miranda i'm not sure there's none of that well, we probably yeah i, think, I, mean, I, think, I feel very passionately I, I about have, this and well, i'm a woman I, and i and i get that and i get that <laughs> personally i have no skin in the game at all and 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 uh -huh. I'm in and and you know and probably would agree with you uh -huh. what 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 I, what I what i see is this like where we where we bring this in to real life uh-huh is being it's like my policy now, which I've started doing, which has been really interesting, is seek, seeking out people who say the opposite to me, uh -huh. finding wise, compassionate people who say the opposite. And I found loads of them. Yeah. And I missed them completely. I thought they were all evil or stupid. Yeah. Turns no, out I agree with that, though. Those that... of them are kind and thoughtful yeah. and just yeah. have a different yeah. perspective. Now, that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that they can offer me back what I'm, I want to offer them. It doesn't necessarily right. mean that. Yeah, but I think though that it's more. This is more about openness and interest to learn. Why do you think what you think, and help me understand? So that is a p position of openness and interest, which is also to me coming out of love, because the desire to understand where someone's coming from is a loving desire. Yeah, it's like I don't understand you, and I want to. Yeah, help yeah. me. Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 so yeah. that to me is a embodiment of love in yeah. and of itself. And yeah. if we were to focus on that a little bit more, all of us, we'd be getting a little further than we are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, I don't. I don't think it's as simplistic. I think there's a lot going on that has more to do with fear, really. And I think that, you know, in times of great change and particularly existential threats like what we're dealing with now, you know, we had this pandemic, none of us could see it and yet it could kill all of us. You know, whole societies shut down. It's kind of wild what we all went through. Mm. And, you know, we didn't have much information or resources. And at first I thought, well, this could be a really amazing time for the human family because here we are all in this together and it really is in everyone's best interest to cooperate and harmonize and and the opposite happened people went down rabbit holes got into really paranoid places got into very fixed you know impenetrable positions in their mind i give a whole body a teaching called relaxing your positionality because in my own community i saw that happening and these were sensible Ed, educated intelligent people who'd been on a spiritual path for decades and i'm sure everyone who's listening to our conversation saw that too friends and how many people do we lose to extreme positions that became impenetrable to any kind of reasonable dialogue and yet, yeah so i we, think we existential the other, the other thing which comes in i'm just thinking in that conversation i'm thinking of myself you know because yeah this this has been quite recent i mean i remember you know i was very pro uh vaccine i'm very pro science uh -huh. uh, i thought we needed to be sensible and all the rest yeah. of it and i live in a community in glastonbury where it's just full of mad ideas yeah and there's an awful lot of rejection of all of that yeah and i had a low opinion of it mm. that's the honest truth uh, but i have a very close friend who's a very smart guy philosopher and much to my shock he was against it and i struggled with that mm. um at first until i actually got to see what he was saying and realized oh there's actually an intelligent position here yeah. which you could have mm. i just hadn't allowed that possibility i just got well they're all stupid aren't they yeah. and and i'm embarrassed by it but that's the honest truth i'm embarrassed to say it but that's the truth and mm. then suddenly by now i'm not he, it's not like i've, I've agreued with him I, more and more i just don't know because yeah, right. i find there's smart people over here and i've associated myself with them which means all those people are evil or stupid now that i'm going oh let's listen to them as well suddenly yeah. it's like, i don't know these people are right. making sense too and there's a yeah. kind of a different and so i find myself embarrassed by my quickness to know when i didn't to take a position and lock down in it yeah right which which is very human and my point was that under extreme existential threats and which we are in and even more so now given climate change and what you know we you know what the united nations said recently about how long we've likely got you know it's not looking good i st still hold a hopeful position but you know the science doesn't 
doesn't justify our hopeful position at this point anyway, you know, that puts, that's a big existential threat. And I think that in those kinds of climates, there's a, just a human tendency to lock down into a fixed position and not remain open to other points of view. And so I, I notice for myself, it is an important part of my ongoing daily spiritual practice to challenge my own positions and to be open to other points of view, even though instinctually I might feel like, no, that ain't right. But to be interested to see what I can learn from yeah, someone else. Yeah. yeah and, yeah. you know, to me, that just feels like an important practice. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't have my point of view. Um, or that I abandon what feels true and right to me practically. Um, but it's, it's a commitment to, to just watch that tendency to lock down in a position. Cause the minute I do that, I'm then closed to learning something new from someone that has a very different position Yeah, that might have, have an important piece of the jigsaw puzzle. I just hadn't considered. So, I'm aware that the one thing that I mentioned to you when we started off before we had this conversation that I wanted to talk to you about was devotion. And we haven't mentioned it once. We got pulled into a million different conversations. So each strand we could return to and spend a, an hour or days probably with, because we've covered so many different things. But, um, and I'm aware you've, you've just returned from being abroad and you've got jet lag. A few minutes on devotion? Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. Cause, um, there's a there's an earth wind and fire song called devotion it'll be played at my funeral uh -huh. and it's just you know it's just like goes back to my my late teens my early 20s when i just put it on and they would take me there um uh and it's it's something which i i i know is popular in certain areas like what you're doing and i use a lot of music which has that power and mm. and i just you know well music has that power just fantastic um and i use it a lot but i i it's not in not in british culture really um mm -hmm. but it is well, in, in your heart i can tell that so and you've made you've you sent me some fantastic music that you've done and so say a little bit about devotion yeah. music, i'm intrigued well i think you know i'll kind of go back in that you know i was ordained as an interfaith minister at the age of 25. oh yeah i remember yeah, and I then that yeah, and then my teacher asked me to create the training in the UK, and he originally wanted me to just to, you know, basically take exactly the seminary that I'd done, and, and I said, you can't transpose something from one culture and plonk it in another and expect that to work. And he said, well, then, you know, how do you want to do it? Do it. Go for, go for it, you know. And one of the things I just intuitively knew was that human beings need to share together not just speaking but they need to sing together and that it's unnatural to gather together with an intention to sort of join and form a kind of a a, a group soul right yeah, to commune yeah. spiritually and for there not to be music and the arts involved and when you look across all the different cultures and traditions they all sang together it's just yeah. what people do, you know, from, yeah. you know, in Christian church, church, the best part of it is the singing. <laughs> it is, it's the best part. And, you know, you stand up and you, you know, and everyone and your voice merges with everyone else's voice and it can be amazing. And let's not forget to bow to the incredible music in the Christian canon, right, that contains Bach and just phenomenal music yeah that, birds mass jeez wow wow mozart's requiem i mean really yeah, stunning yeah, i mean music. that's all you you know just let that take you there because it will yeah. but you look into any tradition and i think some of the best part is this non-linear devotional part where somehow humans turn into their heart and say and sing certain syllables and something magic happens. It just does. Something magic happens in the individual and in the collective mm. that is so immediate to the point where these days I will not bother giving a talk until we've chanted first. Because what I know is 
let's start where we want to end up, shall we? Let's just start there first. Instead of talking and then maybe finding our way to some practice, let's just drop in and then we're going to have a much more meaningful, rich exchange because we'll all be in presence together. We'll all be in communion. So I start every teaching, you know, with a little drop in and Omnama Shivaya because that's what's natural. And then we're there together. It's not Miranda giving a talk. It's here we are together in presence and some good stuff's going to come that I know, right? And it helps me as a seeming individual drop back into the fabric, the unity and feel our togetherness and the fact that we're all here because by some miracle, there's some loving interest to commune with reality, however we understand that. And so to me, devotion is absolutely crucial no matter what path you think you're walking, because the fuel of the path is love. It's not just interpersonal love, but it's the deep love that is there as the pulse within our heart that makes us interested to learn and grow and unfold and be who we are and become who we are and show up in life from our depth. That's a movement of love. And so it's like a way of turning our consciousness back into that love. And it's nonlinear. We have to feel it. And so that's where singing and music comes in because that just takes us there right away. We get out of the mind and we drop into the heart. That isn't just our feelings and our emotions. It's the very heart of our being where we feel the unity and we feel what's true and we can come from that place. And so, you know, I've, I maybe mean, just cause I'm musical, I've always been musical as a kid. Um, you know, when I started studying different traditions, I was always interested. What was always a turn on for me is what's the transformational methodology, you know, very practical down to earth Australian woman, really, you're the philosopher, but I'm, <laughs> I'm a girl, I'm a woman and women are rubber meets road. Well, yeah. that's the way I'm built. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're interested in what actually transform people. I want to know that. Yeah. And what does Christianity have to say about how that happens? How we get from heartbroken on the floor to forgiveness? What does Buddhism have to say about how we become equanimous and peaceful? You know, what is ever, what is, what's the real gold within all these lineages that actually helps us, human beings, personal and collective and bodies of beings evolve? So that's what I've placed my attention on. And, you know, I kept seeing in every tradition, there were syllables where we would somehow say a name of the divine. And I want to contextualize this in that any talk or name of God is really just like a grunt, really, because there are no words that can accurately convey what is the luminous reality that we might call God or truth. It is an ongoing unfoldment that the the mind can kind of get into but we can really only know when we drop in but when we drop in it's beautiful and it's meaningful and we get it and it makes us better so but what i've noticed is that you know anytime i would turn my consciousness into a mantra whether it was a buddhist mantra or a sanskrit hindu mantra or a prayer you know from judaism or christianity I noticed that it had the impact of like bringing my consciousness through a fine mesh cloth and the dust and the distortion and the conflicts would just somehow miraculously get taken care of and I would feel more purely myself. And I noticed that happening in other people. And I also noticed that somehow this also seemed very, very natural to me and that I had no difficulty singing words from foreign languages. It just always had the same impact. And I noticed how happy it made me. Even right now, just talking about it, I could cry. Not because I'm sad, but just because of the sheer beauty and the sheer gift that this is to human beings and how simple and direct. You don't need to believe anything. You just need to give it a go. So the way I relate to devotion is that even if you don't consider yourself a particularly devotional person, it's important. 
because you're only going to get so far, you know, out of your desire to get past your suffering, you know, love is going to carry you the rest of the way and it's going to keep carrying you until your dying breath. And that's what devotion is, it's love. You know, it's love for what's real, whether you like to call that God, truth, who we really are, it doesn't matter. But it does matter that you turn into that love and whatever helps you turn into that love. So what's helped me turn into that love is saying the divine name. And um, so, yeah, so I kind of create all this music because I've been singing it all my life. And sometimes when I go for a walk, sometimes I feel a particular mantra just pop in that I hadn't been thinking about. And I just, oh, I can feel this mantra starting to, why is that come in now? I don't know. It's grace. It's a mystery. All I know is, oh, here's this, here's the Heart Sutra of the Buddha. Okay. So I kind of like to just walk and listen and a tune comes or sometimes it's something I've heard before and sometimes it's something completely new. And every time I give myself to that, it's, it has an impact, it opens me, deepens me, shows me more, helps me feel and learn more. And so I've recorded this. And in fact, I call this mantra album that I'm just coming out with now, call it Streams of Grace. And that title is deliberate because I experience each mantra as it's, it's a living, pulsating stream of grace that contains the love and the prayers of all these beings who have ever sung that mantra. And it's alive. And now I'm part of it too. Mm. Right, so it's, it's a powerful medicine. So you have the past in it. It has, well, time, you know, past, present, future, it all just becomes this sort of holographic kind of alive, pulsating unfolding mm. that is beyond and throughout time and a continuum that can carry us if we pour our, if we just join in it, you know. So, and I've noticed that it's very medicinal, you know, um, I work with it myself, I share it with everyone. Everyone I share it with, they find what I find. They find it useful, they notice it, it clarifies, it opens something, it brings alive beautiful qualities of our depth. Um, and it helps us change the channel. And I think in these times, you know, no matter who you are, there's some stuff going on in our world that's just really hard to be with. And I think it's important Always. to not turn a blind eye to what's going on in the world and just sort of say, oh, I don't watch the news. I think that is not a, a very helpful posture in this day and age. I think we need to keep our eyes open to what's going on, um, but to do so in a way where we don't descend into just judgment and worry. So oftentimes I'm chanting as I'm listening to the news. <laughs> you know, especially when I notice I'm starting to ju get, you know, judge people as idiots or stupid or, mm. you know, when, when that reaction comes up in me, um, I'll turn into a mantra to help me kind of stay present and open. And I love to sing and walk, you know. Beautiful. So, yeah, I mean, it's just something I wanted to do, especially during the pandemic and Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't set out to write books. I set out to make music. That's what. Oh, I, really? Yeah. Yeah. Most of my life I was a musician. I ran what, a tell me about your, you, you, so you, I want to know more about this. So what was your instrument? Um, I was uh, originally a clarinet player actually, but then a guitar uh -huh. player and then um, keyboards and programming and running studios. We wow. had the first workers cooperative recording studio, which was actually the front for an occult lodge, but that's a whole <laughs> other story. And, and uh, yeah, so, and then did all this kind of different things, music, bit of TV music, but mainly the end dance wow. and running shamanic rave shows. Oh, wow. And, uh, and the two things there, which were delightful for me was, um, a track with Ram Dass uh -huh. called another, another level of fun, which was a, it was a, a rave track with Ram Dass, uh, 
taking people on this journey, which was f good fun. And, and and I thought the other day, the other day, there's a while back now, 10 years, no, I don't know, some point before the pandemic, mm -hmm. I was invited to speak at a psychedelic conf um, festival in, in Oregon, I think it was. Uh -huh. for, it was mm -hmm. the eclipse. It was fantastic. Uh -huh. And whenever I go to any of those psychedelic festivals, I just hear Terence McKenna's voice everywhere. I don't know if you know Terence. Do you know Terence? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think really my claim to fame is I was the first person to use Terence's voice um, <laughs> and, do, and did a track with, with Terence called Hurra, Hurra, Hooray in a New Way. I have to hear that is, this. That his DMT experiences. So that was, yeah. it was and, and, and it was only, it was way after that. Beca and the reason was, was because my interest was in transforming people's states. And mm. what I, well, th there, was a, there was a key moment for me when I left university and, and, I, and, and realized that philosophy in the way it was being taught at university was not gonna help me find what I was looking for. And, mm. and got this little pink cottage by a river, had nothing, literally nothing, got rid of all my books. And just a mattress. I thought, that's it, I'm going to go to meditate. And that's what I'm going to do. And I did for a very long time. But towards the end of that period, um, I did accumulate a few things, including a music system. And I started playing Van Morrison's music. And mm -hmm. he was particularly hot at that time in the 80s. Yeah. And I started realizing Van was doing more for me than meditating was. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went, oh, I, I got to go back to music. And mm -hmm. And, and left all of that. And so it was always music because that, that's what, because it, it's instant, isn't it? I mean, it's like it philosophy is good because it lasts though. When you, when you change I, I the think, way you think or you, yeah. I don't think, think, talk to yourself. I mean, the way you actually The way you see and see, you, yeah, the yeah. way you ideate what is. Yeah. If you sh change that in a profound way, it can be changed forever. Well, I think so part of the, the marriage of the experiential things and music, as you said, can change your state like that. It really can. It, 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 it does. It's the question. And psychedelics can change your state like uh, that, taken yes, in the right context. However, a... if you don't understand and contextualize your experience, it doesn't become wisdom. Brilliant. So Brilliant. you need both. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. I mean, I see this also in people, you That's know, right. when I was first teaching after the awakening that happened with Ramana in the cave, I could hardly speak. I didn't really want to speak. So I was just being with people and letting the transmission do the talking. And yeah, people were having big experiences sitting in my presence, but they, that, they couldn't understand why they were experiencing what they're experiencing and what that meant for their life. Yeah. And well, that's limited then, isn't it? You're having wonderful experiences, so, but so, you, so what? What you've just said there, Miranda, it is exactly what has been consuming me for the last 10 years, which is maybe i haven't understood these profound experiences in in the the best way there's mm -hmm. and maybe i have to be willing to go i've been wrong about some fundamental things not like wrong wrong but wrong in that i've seen them in a way which i've picked up from somewhere else and right. thought was the best and it was the best way that i had and then mm -hmm. but maybe it's not the best way and, and well i want to firstly acknowledge you for your humility in being willing to allow some deconstruction of your foundation to happen. And I, I really want to say that to you because it really touches my heart, Tim, that you're willing to let that happen. I am too. And I think that's really important and that few teachers are willing to allow deconstruction and to say, that's what I understood then. And what I'm now experiencing is I'm not sure about that, even though I've published this, I feel that about a lot of things I wrote in my book, Boundless Love. Yeah. It's beautiful. There's great stuff in there. But the, the foundation of where I was coming from was prior to a deeper realization of had since. Yeah. And so I think it's important to say this and for people to hear it to know that none of us are finished products, no matter how wise you might be, how much realization you've had, you and I could have a different realization tomorrow and it could deconstruct everything we've talked about today. Exactly right. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm willing if, if life, truth, God is inviting me to that, then I say, I'm the Mashavaya. Absolutely right. I'm willing because to say anything else, is just to turn this into another religion and that would be a real shame.
beautifully put absolutely right and is probably the underlying reason i wanted to have the conversation with you right uh, ditto. Ditto. Because, because um, i don't know you that well but i have felt that about you and it makes me interested to kind of come and share and cross fertilize and explore um and i also just think it's an important embodiment too for anyone who might be looking to people like yourself and myself and other teachers and often we do look for teachers when we're in some crossroad period of our life and i think it's really important as people in some kind of spiritual leadership to be human and transparent um and to I, not I, I think that's right and that's why i love the stuff you were saying about the ice block and softening the ice block and 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 all of that because that it the my greatest aspiration well, my greatest aspiration dumb thing to say i have loads of aspirations but one of the things which i would aspire to is to try and spirituality i think spirituality needs to evolve i think it has an immensely important role to play in the next phase of human evolution which is actually cosmic evolution because yeah. so we're the leading edge as far as we know and it there's just so much kind of residue from the past straightforward bullshit unthought through un mm, and it just, just like misunderstanding misunderstandings it's just so much and and i when i look at the reason that i feel moved to try and bring together things like like our scientific understanding with this spirituality and go if this is both describing reality they fit they must because mm. the reality is a one yeah and the reason is that that that, that what's happened over here has been so profound we've learned so much so quickly by applying very high standards and having the humility to go we were wrong yeah. and for to go you know newton was a genius wrong now we've got einstein mm -hmm. and in spirituality it feels like we need the same we need ramana mahashi genius wrong because now we've got this or buddha genius but now we got and that same level of we're moving on we're building on their shoulders we are sure are and, 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 and that we can see we can see more and then bring that human wisdom from both all directions and see if it can become one thing and then spirituality can start to play its role yeah well i think it's center of, of i agree with you i totally agree with you because all these bodies of wisdom that have come through the buddha and ramana and nisigadatta and all the sages of each tradition you know they are still true it's just that there's not one that's the only truth I, i'm saying continue. more than that the miranda i'm saying like like it, it's still true in the sense that if you think about the i'm just aware of how long we're talking i hope you're all right but it's such a right. delight to talk to you is yeah. you, know, you think about newton and the g i mean unbelievable genius of being able to to to, to work out the the same law let's just call it because that's what he called it mm -hmm. that makes things fall from a tree yeah. also makes the planets go around each other for the I first know. time in the whole of human history the two, the, the sky and the earth, which were always separate, yeah. reflections, but separate, were the same. It was all one yeah. thing. Yeah. And then for someone like Albert Einstein to come and revolutionize that and go, well, not exactly, actually. Those ideas that he's got, they don't work if you push them and come up with a whole. And, and in that way, it's like, well, for practical purposes, Newton is still used and, and is true. But we actually have moved on. Yeah. It's like, you know, this is actually better. Mm -hmm. And I suspect there'll be further developments. And that's what mm -hmm. I want to see in spirituality. It's like, no, no. Well, I think you've done it. When you go, look, the individual isn't the enemy. No. You didn't say those words, but I, that's what I got from you. Yeah. And, and yeah, I've been saying ego that is that not a demon. Yeah, yeah. And it's not wrong. We yeah. shouldn't have not had an ego. Yeah, exactly. It's not a mistake. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That is... If, if, you know, if you're dealing with this really deep, mystical awakening, mm -hmm. that is a huge movement. Mm -hmm. It is. Oh. It's, a, it's a very paradigm shift. It is. It's that a, is very it's a much big, of, it's, of this time. However, 
you know, it is deep in certain traditions, Kashmiri Shaivism, for example. There's, 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 so there's it, roots of it, of but, different things. Yes. but we're taking it a little further now yeah. to include, you know, the both end, you know, yeah. the universal and the individual and to see, okay, I like to think of ego in essence, not as bad, wrong, good, bad, here, there, but rather surface and depth. So, so oh. the, the revolution for me, what you're putting forward there, that's what you'll find in my books, uh -huh. which I now disagree with. So what I'm, where, it's, where I've ended up now is going, the essence, essay, to be, essence is being, that's what it means. Yes. Your being has no qualities. It's just being. It's yes. just the thing which is yes. being everything. It's not yes. anything. It's just being. Right, right. So the, the, thing, the, th the thing which is that this new... The, the, the awakened states that we enter, the what, deep awake states, these are what is happening to the individual. The individual is evolving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key shift that we've, with, which spirituality needs to make. It needs to go, oh, we now understand we live in an evolving universe. We don't mm -hmm. live in something which is perfect, all set up, just running. Yeah. It wasn't like that. Right. And that we are evolving. And we weren't like this. We were, you know, history... You go, I mean, I'm obsessed by history, but just because it's mm -hmm. such a brutal place. I yes. mean, just an awful place to live. And mm -hmm. the further back you go tends to be more and more awful. And mm -hmm. then we've got this, we're doing really well. We've mm -hmm. evolved. The yeah. level of compassion in the world well, is extreme. I would also say the, we are part of nature. Oh, of course, we are nature. And nature is evolving. Like yeah, if you go to the big island of Hawaii, and, you know, one of the most moving experiences of my life was being on a boat with my husband, Bob, and we're watching new earth forming itself. And it's profound. To, new to be, earth forming. Yeah, I don't, well, I don't, I lava don't coming in oh, to the, right, right, and right, forming right, right. new earth before right, your right, eyes. Right. And, I got you, got you. Right? Yeah, 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 and yeah. you kind of get it. Wow, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Are, we are part of something that is continuing. It's right there before Completely. your eyes. Yeah. And yeah. we're part of that. Yeah. And we're part of the evolution. And who's yeah. evolving? What really? It's all we know is that it's happening and none yeah. of it's separate yeah. from it's part. It's an unfolding, evolving. And then to connect back to where the, we were earlier in the conversation, that's where I get that. So, you know, when I said when I was 25 and it's like my image was a, instead of the judgmental thing, we both agreed about that, you know, was like kind of, oh, what's Tim going to do now? It's more, mm -hmm. I really think that it really, I mean, that our freedom is that much that it's, we don't know what's going to happen next. No, we don't. I don't know what you're going to say next. You don't, it's all, it's literally happening for the first time. And where it's going to go will depend on how everything, you know, it's the one in relationship to itself. And all those relationships will play a role. Yeah, I agree. All of them. And which brings us right back to here and now. And everyone listening to this is how you and I showing up in this moment. You know, what are we bringing in our quality of being and interest to listening to one another, to exploring what is and isn't true. How willing are we to question our presumptions, even our most noble and cherished ones? Yes, especially probably. Especially <laughs> because they're the ones that it's easiest to just not look at and yeah. hide behind, yeah. and they may need an update. And it's hard, you know, I mean, I, like I said, I, I, it, things have changed for me in my 60s that I really feel I should have seen in my 20s or 30s, but I didn't. No, well, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Yeah, yeah. You know, exactly. I mean. Yeah. No, no but, I agree. You're right. You're right. Of course you're right. I, you know, if I could have, I would have. But Exactly. Um, if you could have, you would have. So uh, in a way, that's like, I mean, I get though, yeah, the, right. the, right. the regret, though. And I think there's a difference, though, between guilt and regret. And I think sometimes... We overlook the beauty of regret. I agree. Yeah, there's something. That, like it's good. I notice when I notice when all of a sudden, by the grace of humility, that usually on the way in feels like humiliation. Yeah. But if we open up, no, it is the beauty of humility that prunes us back to something that's purer, and that often we get to see our presumptions get exposed or popped is not quite right. Yeah. you know or that there's a deeper and um, there's a deeper foundation that we just hadn't seen and all of a sudden we see it and it changes us and in that for myself i have seen gosh i was really off there and have felt a deep 
a sense of, oh gosh, I'm sorry. And I've, I found those moments actually very beautiful where there's been no guilt, but there has been this wave of cleansing regret and that has enabled me to kind of sometimes come back to someone. I remember, you know, when I, you know, there were moments when I saw things about, you know, what I thought I knew but didn't when I was counseling people in my 20s and not necessarily being able to contact them because I didn't have their contact details anymore, but, be, but sort of saying it spiritually from my soul to their soul, hey, look, I'm really sorry. I thought I knew what I was talking about when you were dealing with this and I now know that I didn't. Mm. And I really pray that you found what you needed wow. and I, I hope I didn't do too much damage to you. Wow. No, I'm just not understanding what I didn't understand, but I thought I understood. Yeah, yeah. And God bless you. I hope you find what you need on your journey. You know, yeah. and like a, I think there, there was a moment um, in a little while back. This made me laugh, but because I'd always had this, you know, I, I, I've been, I joined the study, the Institute for the Study of Near Death Experiences, when I was in my teens. It was the, when it was set up. Literally, I was one of the kids joined it, uh, fascinated by it. And I've always uh, thought this experience of the life review would be amazing you know these people mm -hmm. describing seeing their whole life yeah. and there was a moment a few years back where i suddenly went oh <laughs> actually <laughs> it's like oh it's, uh, because i'd moved i think from looking back on my life and thinking oh yeah there's my life and actually looking at it now as an old man mm. going oh wow i was so naive and I was so, you know, nothing, I mean, I'm lucky, I'm nothing, I've got no big regrets at all. So I'm very, you know, I've got some sizable ones, but no big ones. And, but nevertheless, that kind of looking back, and I think, and I could see it in my parents before they died, and I can, mm -hmm. you know, and I just imagine it's just going to turn up from now onwards, where you just see I it think so. I think it's part of the positive confrontation of death. I think so too. I think death is the thing that gives us that humility. It does totally. mean Totally. Well, I think the fact, the fact that it's that none of us are getting out of here alive, yeah, you right, know, right. turns the heat up. And as we get older, of course, it becomes, we know that that's coming closer. And, yeah. you know, in the last year, I've lost sort of five really close friends. None oh. of them were particularly old, yeah. you know, and that's powerful if you're open to it. Yeah. that makes you go gosh i mean we all assume that we've got until our 80s but who knows oh yeah, yeah but yeah. none of us know nope. you know whether we're going to wake up tomorrow or whether something's going to happen or someone we love is going to not be here anymore we just don't know we're not it's not in our purview but um if we can kind of not just close down about that and go into denial about it but open up it it can allow these periods of review and cleansing that make us more beautiful, I think. I love that. They make us more beautiful. Mm. Well, I very much hope you wake up tomorrow morning. I hope so too. <laughs> and, and I hope you live to a really ripe old age because I think you'll make a fantastic old woman. I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I really look, think you'll make it. I, I, I just hope that I'm going to be fit enough and compromentous enough to just keep teaching until I'm a very old lady with my hair in a bun and tons of wrinkles on my face because I really love being with people and helping them open up. It's there was a great... A, I, I saw a, a Netflix documentary on Leonard Cohen the other uh -huh. day in which he was touring, having been a zen monk for all that time and come out and, and went back on tour not knowing how it would be and there was this lovely moment where he came on the stage and went it's been 15 years since i was on a stage the last time i was here i was a man in my early 60s full of the hopes and dreams of a young person <laughs> and as someone who's just beginning their 60s it made me laugh because i just thought that's what happens isn't it you know, as, and I could see that with my parents. The older you get, the more every age becomes, oh, right, yeah, you're in that stage. Yeah. And, and now we're in this one. So I really hope that you carry on doing your wonderful work for as long as you possibly can. Thank and... you. And I hope that for both of us, because, you know, if there's one thing I know right now, you know, it's like, here we are. It's an all hands on deck situation. I, just, I love it. Don't you? I just absolutely, it just for, for, for all of its, Ah. yes exactly the good the bad and the ugly it's still grace ultimately the invitation to just open 
yeah. and be here and be available for life and what life wants to do. You know? And the thing which I see in what you're doing, and, and I'm just thinking maybe we should find a you know place to to bring this all together. But I, the the thing that started it off when we were talking about those early experiences and the fact that you're reaching out to people and 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 I I I still do a lot of life stuff as well with people and if I for me I don't know how people who don't have that get through oh I've no idea and I feel I, I've so no lucky idea. to have it so young and for it to keep recurring and returning and me to get to know it and become intimate with it and so the biggest the biggest thing I want is for people to 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 share that and just go here look there's this and it will really it'll really help you through and yeah help yeah. you realize who you, you know your potential all of that stuff but really just like something that's just there something so benign and so yeah yeah so, so loving very, yeah so loving yeah, yeah. so loving well to be continued dear tim and thank yeah, you for having me you. and thank you for everyone who's been listening to this i hope it's been juicy and enjoyable and brought up some stimulating ideas and questions and most of all that it's nourishing for yeah. those who've been listening and thank you god bless you god As bless you and, yeah uh, we'll speak again i'm sure indeed all right my friend take care Bye.